Blog Talk Radio. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Mystery Babylon News Radio with Walt Stickle. Walt has asked me to uh, come and sit in for him tonight and continue our investigation into the Jesuit-led New World Order. My name's Tom Press, and I'm the regular show host of the, a program called Inquisition Update. It's heard Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. Central Time on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Last time, we read to you the Jesuit oath. And tonight, we're going to go through that oath before we proceed on to Daniel chapter 9. I've decided to uh, take a little time with this Jesuit oath and, 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 and do, do some explanation so that those who are unfamiliar with the Jesuits or what their purpose is in the world, can clearly see from their oath that they have indeed fulfilled that oath, that this oath is genuine, and the oath is designed to swear every Jesuit to the destruction of Protestantism. Now remember, Protestantism got its name from the fact of the realization that the Pope was the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, the papacy. When the Protestants, formerly Roman Catholics, who had first read the Scriptures for themselves in their own languages that they could see for themselves in Scripture and in history that the papacy fulfilled every prophecy in the Bible regarding Antichrist. And being Roman Catholics and coming to this realization, they left the Roman Catholic Church and they proclaimed all over the world that the papacy was the Antichrist. Protestant means you know who the Antichrist is, and if you don't know who the Antichrist is, one is hard-pressed to call oneself a Protestant. Protestantism is characterized by their knowledge and attestation to the fact, the historical and biblical and prophetic fact, that the papacy is, was, and always will be the biblical Antichrist in Scripture the man of sin, the son of perdition, the one who deceives the whole world. Now, since the Protestant Reformation was so devastating to the Roman Catholic Church, the realization that the Pope was the man of sin, that people fled from the Roman Catholic Church and clung to the Bible and to Christ and gave up Antichrist. And this was, as it were, an aneurysm to the papacy. The people were flooding out of the church. The the church was bleeding. And it appeared for all intents and purposes that the papacy was dead. The world was abandoning the papacy. The Roman Catholic Church was suffering for a lack of interest more than anything else. And, And the coffers were empty. And... In order to stave off the the ultimate destruction of the Roman Catholic Church and the office of the papacy, the one who calls himself the vicar or the replacement of the Son of God on earth, and that should be worshipped as God and believed and obeyed as as if he were God on earth, the papacy took upon itself to entertain the plan and procedures of a man by the name of Ignatius Loyola. And he became the founder of the Jesuit order. And the Jesuit order was created for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to destroy the Protestant Reformation. And now the Jesuit-led assault against Protestantism is called the Counter-Reformation. It's led by the Jesuit order, and the Jesuit order is assisted by many of the secret societies most familiar to us in the world that are literally clandestine servants, ultimately, of the Jesuit general and the so-called Society of Jesus, the Jesuit order. Now, when we get done dealing with the oath, I will show you how the Jesuits twisted the scriptures in order to exonerate the papacy as the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, and thus render the Protestant Reformation a most grievous assault against the, the 
the, the throne of God on earth. See, once the papacy is exonerated as being the biblical historical antichrist, then all the Protestant reformers are, by default, wrong. The Protestant Reformation was a grievous sin, and that the Pope, at least, is still left open as a possibility of being the throne of God on earth. And this is where we are today. Most people who call themselves Protestants would never even mention the papacy as a candidate for, for the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist because of a common teaching <clears throat> that, is, that is presented in nearly every Protestant church today, a teaching that is only about three generations old, a teaching that was never heard of in the world up until about three generations ago. And before that, common belief was that the papacy was the Antichrist. All right. Last week, I won't read it again verbatim, but I'm going to break this oath down. This is the oath that every Jesuit takes when he is elevated to a position of command in the militia of the Pope, the Jesuit order. Now, he is spoken to by the superior general. He says, my son heretofore, that is prior to now, you have been taught to act the dissembler. Now, most people uh, would ask, well, what is a dissembler? A dissembler is someone who pretends to be of another faith that he act than he actually is. Every, every Jesuit priest is a Roman Catholic. But in their training, they are, learnt, they are taught <clears throat> to, to disguise themselves as a member of any religion, all religions, or one specific religion that is not Roman Catholic in order to infiltrate those churches and then to corrupt them, either in, infiltrate the Protestant churches or infiltrate Buddhism or infiltrate... Hinduism or Islam or all the religions of the world to study those religions and to ultimately find a common ground with the Roman Catholic Church to either destroy those churches altogether, which is the, 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 the very goal of the Jesuits for Protestantism, or to bring all these other pagan religions in with the Roman Catholic Church to make a global religion out of them. Now, this, is, this describes in very brief what the history of the, of the Jesuit order has been. Through their missionary services around the world, uh, they have studied every religion on the earth, and they have discovered how to uh, dissemble, how to uh, controvert those religion and those religionists to either destroy them or gobble them up within the Roman Catholic Church. All right. My son, heretofore you have been taught to act the dissembler among Roman Catholics to be a Roman Catholic. In other words, when a Jesuit is a Roman Catholic and he attends a Roman Catholic Church, he is to be a spy in that Roman Catholic Church to keep the Jesuit general informed. He continues, he says, and to be a spy even among your own brethren. So that's what he is, a spy even among Roman Catholics. To believe no man, to trust no man. And it says, among the reformers, to be a reformer. That is, every Jesuit priest, when he is among reformers, that is, Protestant reformers, Protestants, he is to act like a reformer, to be one of them. And it says, among the Huguenots, to be a Huguenot. That is, whenever a Jesuit is among the Huguenots, which is a, a sect of French Protestantism, a Protestantism, uh, they were to act like Huguenots. And he says, among Calvinists, to be a Calvinist. And other Protestants, generally, to be Protestant. And to obtain their confidence to seek even to preach from their pulpits and to denounce with all the vehemence in your nature 
our holy religion, Roman Catholicism, and the Pope. So they are to make sure that no one suspects that they're Roman Catholic, even if it takes denouncing the Roman Catholic Church as the Church of Antichrist in order to ensure that he is perceived as a Protestant among Protestants in order to gain their confidence, in order that he might more, more thoroughly spy upon them. He continues, he says, and to denounce with all your vehemence and nature our holy religion and the Pope, and even to descend so low as to become a, Je a Jew among Jews, that you might be enabled to gather together all information for the benefit of your order as a faithful soldier of the Pope. So one of the principal uh, duties of a Jesuit is to dissemble, to, to pretend to be a member, a most faithful member, of all the other religions in the world, particularly Protestantism, even to the point of, of being uh, appointed to preach from behind their pulpits. And trust me, folks, they do. Jesuit-trained uh, pastors of, Roman, uh, of Protestant churches are secretly Roman Catholic, and they're teaching false doctrine and a twisting of a particular series of scriptures that we'll deal with. Uh, as soon as we continue, as soon as we wrap it up here with the Jesuit oath. Now, he says, you have been taught to plant insidiously the seeds of jealousy and hatred between communities, provinces, states that were at peace, and to incite them to deeds of blood, involving them in war with each other, and to create revolutions and civil wars in countries that were independent and prosperous, cultivating the arts and sciences, enjoying the blessings of peace, to take sides with the combatants, and to act secretly with your brother Jesuit who might be engaged on the other side, but openly opposed to that which you might be connected, only that the church might be the gainer in the end." He is simply saying one of the main strategies of the Jesuits is to not take on their enemies directly, but to incite their enemies against one another so that they might achieve for them their own destruction. So they are to incite the seeds of jealousy and hatred between communities of heretical faiths, uh, a hatred between communities, provinces, states that were at peace, and incite them to deeds of blood. That's warfare. Involving them in war with each other. With each other. See, the Jesuits don't, don't fight wars directly. They incite their enemies to war against one another so that they may win without even having to strike a blow, without even having to blow their cover. And as a matter of fact, history and current events now is showing that the, Jesuits, that the Jesuit order controls the banks that finance these wars and conflicts between communities and provinces and states that were at peace, involving them in civil war, deeds of blood, in order that the, that, the, that the Roman Catholic Church may be the gainer in the end. It says to create revolutions and civil wars in countries that were independent and prosperous. And a, a, a careful study of the civil war from truthful historians will tell you that Pope Pius IX sided with the South, Jefferson Davis. And the Jesuits were working on the side of the North to divide this country and to precipitate a civil war in this country for the purpose of not only killing off the so-called heretics, the Protestants in this country, be there when the war was over, but in other words, throughout the war, to manage the war, to keep it going for as long as they could, and so that they could 
ma- manipulate and manage the outcome of the war, all the while financing both sides of the war and profiting from the from the war themselves through through the sale of ammunition, gunpowder, lead, and and every other uh, necessary part of war. And then when the war was finally over, and the outcome that was determined by both sides of the Jesuits working on both sides to sit at the conference table to help determine the, the, the conditions of the peace. That's what is in the oath. That's how the Jesuits operate. And many people who, who claim that this oath is not authentic and that it's made up to calumniate or to give a bad reputation to the Jesuits, all one has to do is study their history and the wars that they have precipitated and managed and perpetuated and financed and settled when it was over, clearly you can see that they have followed their oath. This oath is indeed genuine. If you had never seen this oath before, and you had been careful to watch the Jesuits and how they operate through history, and then use the evidence that you saw with your eyes, and then try to create an oath that reflected their behavior, this is what you would write. The very oath that the Jesuits and the Roman Catholic Church and the friends of the Jesuits say is a fraud. So they, 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 they foment wars. The Bible tells us plainly, wars, wars, rumors of wars. And by peace he, de- he, he shall deceive many. Okay, that is exactly the way the Jesuits operate. Stand back in the background, pretending to be uh, the harbingers of peace, while at the same time under camouflage and under disguise, they are working on both sides of the conflict to foment it, to keep it going, to to finance it, to profit from it, to extend the war for as long as necessary to achieve the outcomes that they want, and then to sit at the conference table at the settlement to get the final agreements that they want. In every case, the Vatican, if you you study history, you find that the Vatican is the winner in the end overall. Now, he says, to take sides with the combatants, to act secretly with your brother Jesuit, who might be engaged on the other side. So in their oath, it shows us plainly that in every conflict, you'll find the Jesuits operating on both sides, being faithful to both sides, but in the meantime, coordinating and cooperating and communicating with his other, his friendly Jesuit on the other side in order to manipulate the outcome of the war. <clears throat> Excuse me, he says, to take sides with the combatants and to act secretly with your brother Jesuit, who might be engaged on the other side, but openly opposed to that which you might be connected. In other words, appearing to be in opposition to this other side, when in fact there's a plant on both sides of the line operating. He's going to openly oppose, but secretly coordinate. Now it says, now what is the purpose of all this intrigue and fomentation of wars? It says, only that the church, and that means the Roman Catholic Church, might be the gainer in the end, in the conditions fixed in the treaties for peace, and that the end justifies the means. The Jesuits right here acknowledge that what they do is wicked. But they have a motto and a a modus operandi that says, whatever uh, you decide is good, if you decide to achieve a goal that you believe is good, then whatever means whatever means possible of achieving that desired end, whether it be good or bad, is also good. The end justifies the means. In other words, 
every act of deceit, of, of, of intrigue, of traitorism, of thievery, of robbery, every crime committed, if it be to serve the end in view as desired, then it too is good. Now, this is the way the Jesuits uh, exonerate themselves from any accusation of a crime or sin, because the end that those crimes and sins committed was a benefit to the one holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church, the only church whereby men can be saved, according to Roman Catholic doctrine. So whatever they do for the benefit of the church is good because that is the good goal of the, of the Jesuits. <clears throat> That's why they have no compunction of committing assassinations, <clears throat> of, of fomenting wars between people that were at peace, and then financing the wars and keeping them going. All of these things you and I would immediately identify as, as despicable. But if it benefits the Roman Catholic Church, they are meritorious works. They're not sins and they're not crimes. They are works worthy of merit. Now it says, further, you have been taught your duty as a spy, which is exactly what we've been talking about since the very beginning here. You have been taught your duty as a spy to gather all statistics facts, and information in your power from every source. Now, a Jesuit, when they, when they serve in the Jesuit order, they are to take on any disguise. Jesuits operate in every area of life. You might well even find a Jesuit being a street sweeper or someone who works cleaning sewers or someone who works behind the microphone at one of the mainstream media sources. Or you might even have a Jesuit uh, working in Congress or the Supreme Court. Every, every walk of life, and this is purposeful, so that the Jesuits can gain information from every aspect of the society. They are masters of disguise, and they use disguise in order to infiltrate churches, to infiltrate other religions, <clears throat> to infiltrate occupations, to infiltrate uh, power uh, positions of power. In other words, to keep them on the pulse of the nation from top to bottom. He says, you have been taught your duty as a spy to gather all statistics. Okay? To, that's their purpose, to gain information. They are... Uh, Hoarders of data, information. And he says, uh, you have been taught your duty as a spy to gather all statistics, facts, and information in your power from every source. From every source. To ingratiate yourself into the competence of the family circle of Protestants. That's right. They are to ingratiate themselves and seek the confidences of Protestants and their families. And it says, and heretics of every class and character, not just Protestants. And it says, as well as that of the merchant, the banker, the lawyer, among the schools and universities to be teachers, in parliaments to be legislature, legislators, and the judiciaries and the councils of state. The judiciaries is the courts, and the councils of state are the halls of government. And to be all things to all men for the Pope's sake, whose servants we are unto death. That is the purpose of a Jesuit, to infiltrate the lowest and the highest ranks and organizations of society to gain information, statistics, and facts in order to help strengthen the Roman Catholic Church and to plot these wars and controversies 
so that the Roman Catholic Church might be the, the gainer in the end. He says, to, to, uh, 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 and to be all things to all men. In other words, never to engage in controversy themselves, but to be a friend of all men. Not, they, don't, they don't handle the controversies themselves. They foment controversy. And so they appear to be all things to all men, and they do this for the Pope's sake, whose servants we are unto death. A Jesuit, when he swears an oath to the Jesuit general, there's no reneging on the oath. You're never dismissed from the Jesuit. You simply know too much to be let go. Once a Jesuit, always a Jesuit. The oath continues, says, you have received all your instructions heretofore as a novice, a neophyte, a beginner, basically, and have served as a coadjutor, confessor, and priest. But you have not yet been invested with all that is necessary to command in the army of Loyola, in the service of the Pope. You must serve the proper time as the instrument and executioner as directed by your superiors. For none can command here who has not consecrated his labors with the blood of the heretic. For, quote, without the shedding of blood, no man can be saved, unquote. You know, one of the defining characteristics of Satan himself is that he twists the scriptures the scripture said, the scriptures say that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. But the Jesuits twist that and say, without the shedding of blood, no man can be saved. In other words, you cannot be saved as a Jesuit until you have slain a heretic. It's part of the initiation to become a Jesuit general, become a superior in the militia of the Pope. Now he says, therefore, to fit yourself for your work and make your own salvation sure, you see, they, they have to earn their salvation in the Jesuit order. He says, in order to make your salvation sure, you will, in addition to your former oath of obedience to your order and allegiance to the Pope, repeat after me. All right, now here is the oath proper. We're going to break it down and, and explain it as best we can. The, the postulant kneels, as we talked about before, with a dagger held in the, in the Jesuit's hand and pressed against his naked breast right above his heart. He says, I now, and states his name, now in the presence of Almighty God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Blessed St. John the Baptist, the Holy Apostles St. Peter and Paul, and all the saints, the hosts of heaven, and you, my ghostly father, the superior general of the Society of Jesus, founded by Ignatius Loyola in the pontificate of Paul III, and continued to the present, do by the womb of Mary, the matrix of God, and the rod of Jesus Christ, declare and swear that His Holiness the Pope is Christ's Vice Regent and is the true and only head of the Catholic or Universal Church throughout the earth. These Jesuits invoke what are known in the Roman Catholic Church as saints. They pray to these saints for assistance in their purposes as Jesuits. This is forbidden in the Bible. It's called necromancy, yet it is the basis for the Jesuits and what they do in the world. And I see I've about run out of time already, uh, at least for the half hour. Uh, let's see. Well, i got a half an hour left, so I'll continue. Now, he is swearing this oath. He believes in the presence of God Almighty. But I'm here to tell you that such a diabolical oath of this, as this is not, is not sanctioned by God. And he is not in the presence of God Almighty because God turns his back on this kind of sin 
And if there is any God in the presence of one swearing such a diabolical oath of th as this, it has to be a God either of their own imagination or the God of this world, Satan himself. And anyone who reads this, this oath can come to only one conclusion. These Jesuits do not swear this oath in the presence of God Almighty, unless that God Almighty is the one they call Lucifer, the one God calls Satan after changing his name and casting him out of heaven. But nonetheless, they swear, they swear that they, they say this oath in the presence of God Almighty and the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now, we all know who they're talking about, or at least we think we do. But she's dead, lying peacefully in her grave, waiting the resurrection of the righteous. Mary, the mother of Jesus, does not hear this oath. Thank God that God Almighty has spared her from seeing how her name has been destroyed by the Roman Catholic Church and by these Jesuits in the swearing of this oath. And not only do they swear by God and, the, and, and Mary, but they swear by the blessed St. John, the holy apostles, St. Peter and Paul, and all the saints, the sacred hosts of heaven. Are we to swear by the throne of Almighty God? The Bible clearly says it's a sin to swear by the throne of Almighty God because the earth is God's footstool. But that's what the Jesuits do. They swear by dead people's names in the belief that these, these saints of God still live and can still intercede and to assist their activities of intrigue diabolical activities on the earth. And what, what a way to slander all their names, to bring them into this oath as though they were a portion of this oath, this diabolical oath. Thank God that they all lie peacefully in their graves and not aware of how their names are being slandered in this oath. Now, he says, he even swears to you his ghostly father. What is that an acknowledgement of? But the Jesuit general calls him the ghostly father. It's, it's an irrigation of, of some supernatural aspect of the Jesuit general. See, every Jesuit is supposed to view the Jesuit general as the voice of God Almighty on the earth. Yes, they acknowledge the, the white pope, as he is called, uh, the current uh, Pope Francis III and all of his predecessors, as, as the voice of God. But that's only for public consumption. A Jesuit does not obey the white pope. And in many cases throughout history, when the white pope contended with the Jesuit order, the Jesuit order killed that pope, as in the case of Pope Clement the Thirteenth, Pope Clement the Fourteenth, Pope uh, Pope Paul the First, and Pope John or excuse me, Pope John Paul the First, and Pope Paul the Sixth. They killed many popes because they were at war with the papacy, contending over who is going to control the Jesuits, whether it's going to be. The, 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 the superior general, the Jesuit general, the black pope, or whether it's going to be the white pope. So the Jesuit general, no matter what a Jesuit says in reference to the white pope, sees the black pope, the Jesuit general, as the voice of God on earth, and he is to be obeyed without question, without equivocation, to be obeyed instantly, without thought or repining. He says, the superior general of the Society of Jesus, founded by St. Ignatius Loyola, and we talked about him before, a Basque soldier uh, of Spain who was wounded in battle and looking for a challenge, and so he took on the Protestant Reformation. 
And the Jesuit order was created by him. The constitution of the order was created by him. This Jesuit oath was created by him. And it was sanctioned officially by a papal bull during the pontificate of Pope Paul III in 1540 A.D. He says, I now present in the presence of Almighty God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Blessed St. John, the Apostles, St. Peter and Paul, and all the saints, sacred host of heaven, and you, my ghostly father, the superior general of the Society of Jesus, founded by Ignatius Loyola in the pontificate of Paul III, and continued to the present, do by the womb of the Virgin Mary, the matrix of God, that is... That is an acknowledgment right here of their belief that the womb of the Virgin Mary was the creator of God, that God was created by Mary or created in Mary's womb. That's why they regard Mary as the mother of God, not the mother of Jesus. That's why they deify the, the Virgin Mary. And they make her superior to Jesus. As a matter of fact, Roman Catholics pray at least 50 times more to Mary than they do to Jesus. They believe that Mary was, gave birth to God. She's the mother of God, not the mother of Jesus. <laughs> it says, Do by the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the matrix of God, and the rod of Jesus Christ, they believe that the Virgin Mary is the rod of Jesus Christ. She's really the one that we have to answer to, according to them. Declare and swear that His Holiness the Pope is the Vice Regent of God and is the true and only head of the Catholic or the Universal Church throughout the earth. Now, here's another point I want to make. The Roman Catholic Church teaches its children in catechism at the youngest ages in the parochial schools that the word Catholic and the word universal are changeable words. You may just as rightly uh, uh, use the term universal church to describe the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, he said that the Jesuit general is Christ vice regent, or rather the Pope is, the, is Christ vice regent, in other words, the replacement of the Son of God on earth, and is the true and only head of the Catholic or universal church throughout the earth, and that by virtue of the keys of binding and loosing given to His Holiness by my Savior Jesus Christ, He hath power to depose heretical kings, Princes, states, commonwealths, and governments. Now, let me stop right there. The Roman Catholic Church teaches its children from cradle to grave that when Jesus asked the apostle, Whom do you say that I am? He said, Thou art the, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he described what Christ was. And Christ replied to him, only my Father could have revealed this to you. Okay? And it says, upon this rock will I build my church. Now, the Roman Catholic Church twists the meaning, just as Satan always does, twists the meaning of Scripture. They twist it to mean that Peter, the apostle, who said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That Peter is the rock and foundation of the church. But Scripture clearly says over and over and over that Christ is the rock and foundation of the church, and we are all brethren. Now, with this basis of understanding, of false understanding, that Peter is the rock and the foundation of the church, they also teach that the popes and all their successors throughout history are likewise the rock and foundation of the church. The church is built upon the papacy. 
that the church was founded by Peter. And that they possessed the keys of binding and loosing, and everybody's read the passages in the Scripture that talk about the key. Whatever you bind in, on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. They ascribed this power to bind and to loose to Peter and then to the popes, his successors throughout history. And they say that this power of binding and loosing is given solely to His Holiness the Pope by Jesus Christ. And that with this power of binding and loosing, the Pope has power to depose kings, princes, states, commonwealths, and governments, and authorizes him to destroy them. If they if they got, if they get out of his will, <clears throat> so this power of binding and loosing is artfully de depicted in Roman Catholic iconography, <clears throat> even on the papal flag, as represented by two keys: a golden one and a silver one. And they are crossed. They, one lays over the other in the pattern of an X. The golden key always lies on top of the silver key when it's properly represented. Some I've seen some in error. But this, this denotes that the spiritual power of the Pope, his power as the rock and foundation of the church, the spiritual teacher of the church, is held in, uh, that position is held firmly by the silver key, which represents his temporal power on the earth, his king of kings status. This, the golden key represents the spiritual power of the church, represents his lord of lord status in the world. The silver key represents his temporal power in the world, his king of kings status. And we all know, or many of us at least, who have studied anything about the Roman Catholic Church, understand that the Roman Catholic Church teaches that the Pope is the spiritual leader of the Church, and that every Roman Catholic must believe what the Holy, what the Holy Father, as they call him, what he teaches is, is, is a matter of religious dogma, and that if you depart from the belief as taught by the papacy, then you have departed from the faith. You see, they put the Pope in the place of Jesus Christ on earth, and that if you disagree or don't believe or don't assent to his spiritual power, you have departed from the faith. And likewise... He has a silver key representing his temporal power, his king of kings status. And it's, it's through the power of this kingly status that he maintains by force and coercion his spiritual power. And he is not just a spiritual leader in the Roman Catholic Church, but that he is also a temporal king. King of kings and lord of lords. All this discussion about the two keys of binding and loosing, the spiritual power and the temporal power, are simply used to make the Pope out to be the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's counterfeiting Christ. And he says, with this temporal power, that he has the power to seat and unseat kings. In other words, he has the power to pick the kings of the earth, and he also has the power to remove them from their throne at any time. He also has the power to destroy princes and states and commonwealths and governments, and that any or all of them may be safely destroyed by the Pope without committing you any sin. Ten seconds, Tom. Because this is his business on the earth. 
Now, we'll continue with this the next time on the program on installment three of this of this study, and I thank you for listening. We'll be back next.